Okay, then let's uh, continue where we left off, and we'll turn to uh, point 12. And uh, uh, I introduced this uh, with the words, uh, more on the rationality and efficiency of the free market in responding to changes in economic conditions. Uh, there can be some situations in which the demand for some things goes up, the demand for other things goes down. Uh, and if they're produced with the same sorts of factors of production, uh, there would be no lasting effect on relative prices. Imagine, for the sake of illustration, the demand for refrigerators rose and the demand for washing machines fell. Well, uh, these, uh, these things can probably be produced even in the same factories, they use the same sorts of materials, the same sorts of labor. So uh, we could expand the supply of refrigerators uh, from the same factors of production that we withdrew from the production of washing machines or whichever. And uh, this would be a relatively uh, simple situation. But let's deal now with a more complicated case where there's an increase in the demand for uh, the kind of a product uh, well, we have an increase in the demand for uh, certain things, a decrease in the demand for other things, but the products in additional demand uh, cannot be produced in larger quantity with factors of production released from the products in reduced demand. Let me give you immediately a concrete example. Uh, suppose, for whatever reason, we had a rise in the demand for wristwatches, and people got the money for this uh, by curtailing their expenditures on the rest of their wardrobes. So we have more money spent to buy wristwatches, less money spent to buy uh, suits and dresses. Now, uh, I, I pick this example because I think the uh, types of people who are working in the garment industry uh, would not be able uh, to cross over and uh, become watchmakers. So I'm assuming uh, we have this rise in demand for watchmakers, a fall in demand for garment workers, or garment, uh, the products of the garment industry, and uh, there's no way uh, to simply shift the factors of production from the one to the other, as in the case of the uh, washing machine uh, uh, refrigerator example. All right, let's think through what will happen, because uh, I want to develop this case to point out that uh, in a free market, uh, every change in the demand for or supply of any factor of production, as I put it here, is dealt with in a way that uh, maximizes gains and minimizes losses. And I want to show how uh, the maximization of gains and the minimization of losses is indicated in this example of a shift in demand from uh, clothing to watches and the inability of the labor to move from the one to the other. All right, here we are. We have a rise in the demand for watches, and this is going to result in a rise in the demand for the services of watchmakers. What would be the effect of this on the wage rates of watchmakers? They'll go up. But now, there are uh, some other groups of workers uh, whose services could be used in watchmaking. Uh, workers uh, in related fields where similar skills are acquired. Uh, Probably these would be workers uh, making instruments of various types, uh, perhaps workers in the optical goods industry. There'd be some uh, other uh, groups of workers whose uh, services are such that perhaps with some retraining, it would not be all that out of the question to uh, expand the supply of watches. All right, so here we are, uh, to the extent that uh, the wage rates of watchmakers rise, and workers in related lines have the ability to, to work as watchmakers, uh, what will happen to the movement of labor uh, from such lines as optical goods and instrument making uh, into watchmaking? Okay, there'll be workers uh, leaving uh, instrument making, uh, optical goods, whatever, and moving into uh, the more remunerative field of watchmaking. All right, well, what is the effect of this on the wage rates of optical goods workers and instrument uh, makers. They will go up. So now notice, uh, we have a rise in the demand for a particular product, watches, that requires uh, factors of production of a certain kind that are in limited supply. Uh, 
and uh, it's the production of watches can be expanded at the expense of the uh, production of other things using uh, a, a group of workers of broadly similar skills. And the effect is uh, to uh, transmit the rise in demand for watches and watchmakers labor into a rise in the wage rates of the broader category of labor, uh, the workers in these related fields of optical goods and instrument making. And what would be the effect of their wage rates on the uh, costs of production and then on the prices of instruments and optical goods? They will go up too. If, uh, if the prices of instruments and optical goods are uh, governed in any way by their costs of production, a rise in their costs proceeding from a rise in the wage rates of their workers, uh, proceeding from a rise in the demand for watchmakers and their wage rates, uh, that will raise the cost and prices of uh, the optical goods and, uh, and the instruments. And now, uh, in response to uh, the rise in the prices of optical goods, instruments, whatever, uh, what's going to happen to the quantities of them demanded at their higher prices? There'll be less. Okay, now, can anyone see what in the last analysis is determining uh, the, the extent to which watchmaking expands at the expense of the uh, allied lines uh, using the same sorts of factors of production? Uh, to what extent, uh, what will determine the extent to which watchmaking expands at the expense of optical goods, uh, or more specifically, eyeglasses of different types, uh, what extent uh, it expands at the expense of the production of various types of instruments? Is, is this chaos? Is it random? Or is there any principle determining the extent to which watchmaking expands at the expense of the related lines? Well, you say uniformity to profit. Can anyone think of anything else here? Demand. Pardon me? It'll be based on the demand. It'll be based on the demand uh, in response to the higher prices of instruments, optical goods, etc. Uh, the consumers curtail their purchases. Now, which of the items they previously had been able to purchase will they dispense with in terms of their importance? Yes? Oh, watches. No, they want that we start off, no, they I want more watches. Pardon me? Well, they've spent less on clothes, but uh, the garment workers cannot be used to enlarge the supply of watches. They lack the necessary <coughs> skills. They can't acquire the necessary skills. Uh, the workers who could enlarge the supply of watches are optical goods workers, instrument makers, people of that kind. And the question I'm now raising is, uh, what will determine the extent to which the additional labor for watchmaking is released from instrument making or from optical goods or both, or any other field? The demand. The demand. Now, uh, in, the, in connection with the demand, uh, which goods will the consumers dispense with in, ter in, in response to the higher prices? Which optical goods, which instruments will they give up that they previously could afford? Those they consider the most important or those they consider the least important? Okay, so notice the ex additional labor for the expansion of watches will be drawn from the previously marginal employments of this broader category of labor. The labor uh, required for the expansion of watchmaking will come from the previously marginal employments of such labor. That might mean uh, coming from uh, the making of uh, specialty sunglasses, uh, uh, telescopes for amateur astronomers. Uh, it'll be the market which decides. So you notice uh, if the rise in demand for watches and the services of watchmakers uh, ends up raising the prices of eyeglasses, well, uh, how, in what way will consumers cut back on their purchase of eyeglasses? Uh, maybe they would have purchased uh, two pair of reading glasses and a pair of sunglasses. Now the price is higher. They'll discontinue one of these things. Which one will they discontinue? Sunglasses. Whatever they consider the least important. So for some people it's sunglasses. For some it may be the second pair of reading glasses. It'll differ from person to person. Uh, other people uh, faced with a higher price of instruments, 
Uh, that means uh, hobbyists uh, pursuing home astronomy, uh, they have to pay more for telescopes. Well, uh, maybe they'll give up uh, the telescopes or buy smaller, cheaper ones. Uh, the wider principle is uh, the labor made available for the expansion of watchmaking will come from uh, the previously marginal employments of that labor, the least important of the employments uh, to which it was previously devoted the least important among the most important employments. Okay, now, uh, how, would, how does this example differ uh, in outcome uh, from instead of being initiated uh, by an enlargement in the demand uh, for uh, one of the types of products and labor, uh, suppose simply there was a reduction in the supply of such labor. Instead of there being a greater demand uh, for the whole category of such labor, uh, we had, and having to take it uh, from its previously marginal uses, uh, suppose we had a reduction in the supply of such labor, uh, the broader supply of people possessing this set of skills. Pardon me? Very skilled people. Yes, we'd have very highly skilled people doing this work, but uh, let's suppose uh, some disease spreads among them. Uh, they get a virus from some of their uh, microscopes or whatever, and uh, th their number is reduced to a certain degree. Now we have fewer such workers. Uh, what will happen to their wage rates? The wage rates will go up. Now, it doesn't matter in which specific line this originated, whether it was in the watchmaking line or uh, it was in instrument making or wherever. Uh, there's less of the labor overall. What will be the effect of a rise in the wage rates of any component, any portion of this uh, category of labor, on the wage rates of the others? They'll go up, and now, uh, even though uh, most of the workers lost might have been lost in one particular line, does that mean that that line uh, will bear the whole burden of the reduction in this supply of labor? What happens as the wage rates of that supply of labor go up? It'll attract labors, uh, labor from the r related lines. Okay, now, uh, from which lines will the labor be released? What's going to determine which of these various lines uh, releases labor, uh, given the overall reduction in the supply of labor? Uh, the least important. The least important. The least important. So, uh, whether there is an increase in the demand for labor of a given type, or a decrease in the supply of such labor, in both cases, uh, some of this labor will have to be moved from certain employments to other employments. Uh, in one case, it has to be moved uh, to satisfy the additional demand for watches. In the other case, it has to be moved uh, to make up for a reduction in the supply, perhaps, of instrument workers. In both cases, where does the loss get taken out? The least important. Any time there is an increase in the demand or a decrease in the supply, uh, the supply that is no longer available will be uh, at the expense of the previously marginal employments. And there will be a supply no longer available to expand watchmaking. Uh, that supply is no longer available in instrument making and optical goods, and it will be taken from the least important employments there. So, and this will of course apply not just to labor in scarce supply, but to anything. It'll apply to crude oil in scarce supply. Uh, in a free market, if we have a reduction in the supply of crude oil, uh, what's the effect on the price of crude oil? It goes up. What's the effect on the price of all oil products? It goes up. Now, uh, the rise in the price of all oil products will have to be sufficient so that uh, the reduction in quantity demanded of the various oil products will result in a reduction in the quantity demanded of oil equal to the reduction in the supply of oil. Now, where is the supply reduction carried out uh, in a free market? From which oil products and to what extent will, will there be uh, a, a reduction in, uh, in supply made available? The least important oil product. In the least important, in the previously marginal oil products, as uh, indicated by where the consumers cut back in response to the higher prices. Now, what sort of thing uh, goes into the outcome? Uh, what will the consumers be considering? And, and the people along the way, uh, all of the uh, business users of oil, uh, 
uh, as the uh, price of oil is rising to them, uh, that represents rising costs of production, and they'll want to uh, minimize the rise in costs. Uh, so what will uh, business firms be doing in uh, determining their own responses? They cut down on the least important expenses. Well, uh, how will they know uh, what, what considerations will decide if a previous use of oil is not particularly important and can more or less easily be dispensed with? One with the least demand. Pardon me? The one with the least demand. Well, what will determine uh, the extent of the demand of, of a business firm uh, for oil products? Now, they might be considering, uh, uh, for one thing they would certainly consider is, do they have any alternatives uh, to the use of this oil product, at least in, in its previous quantity? So uh, imagine uh, you were the uh, shipping manager of a firm, and you're faced with the higher transportation costs, uh, the higher cost of shipping your products. So uh, you know that uh, truckers' rates have gone up. Uh, what will you be looking at uh, if it's uh, if it possibly available? Do you have any alternative methods of shipping? Uh, if uh, uh, rail rates have not gone up so much, or there's uh, barge transportation available, uh, you'll uh, switch uh, based on whichever has the least rise in cost. Now maybe uh, there's no, you don't have an alternative, and uh, you have to, you have to simply uh, pass through uh, the the higher cost. And maybe you can't pass it through, uh, and if you can't pass it through, uh, maybe you're just plain unprofitable. Well, then what happens? Then your operation will stop. Those operations will stop, which the consumers are unwilling uh, to compensate uh, with sufficiently higher prices for their products. <coughs> so it might be we have uh, a, a company uh, using various oil products uh, to produce widgets, and the, uh, the consumers are unwilling to allow a sufficient rise in the price of widgets uh, to make the operations of this company uh, profitable, even uh, to cover its operating costs. In which case, what will happen uh, to its production of widgets? <coughs> it will cease. And so uh, there you have a reduction in the quantity demanded of oil. The consumers have decided uh, this particular oil using product is not sufficiently important. Uh, we're not going to uh, allow prices that would cover the higher cost. And the thing is flat out unprofitable, doesn't even cover the operating costs. And so uh, that is partly a way of reducing the quantity demanded uh, toward the reduction in supply available. Uh, always, uh, the quantity demand, uh, the uh, areas that will cut back their consumption are those uh, that have uh, ready alternatives available, uh, where the uh, uh, the loss uh, can be dealt with most easily. Uh, and those products which the consumers consider insufficiently important uh, to continue in the light of the higher necessary price. Yes, uh, Mike. Okay, and this is the connection with the word. You're talking about the, uh, the workers, say, making clothing and consumers now have a higher demand for, say, watches. And the connection between the optical, all the other instruments and all those things. Yeah. The production, I can see how that shifts. Yeah. But what happens to the workers that can't shift from the? Okay, very good question. And that's part of the, the analysis too, and I've neglected that so far. Uh, so let's immediately turn to that. Uh, where do the garment workers go? Now these ex-garment workers uh, will be fanning out into many different areas. Uh, each of them will be considering, what else could I do besides be a garment worker? And then, uh, w uh, to the extent there is more than one opportunity, uh, which of the uh, different possible opportunities open to them uh, do you think they're going to choose? They'd have to take lower wages, but uh, let's say uh, up to now they had been making uh, uh, $500 a week working as a garment worker, and uh, now they're going to have to take less. Uh, if they become a restaurant worker, a particular one, uh, he can make $400 a week uh, doing yet something else. Uh, he can make $300 a week. Uh, which do you think he's going to go for? Uh, 
that which represents the least fall in his income, and uh, what, what areas will be able to absorb uh, these uh, former garment workers uh, with the least fall in their wage rates. It'll be those areas uh, where the consumers are prepared to expand their quantities demanded uh, with the least fall in prices. It'll be those areas where the consumers are uh, prepared to buy more uh, with the least fall in prices. That's where the garment workers will end up going. Uh, they, uh, some of them will end up as restaurant workers if uh, the consumers are willing to absorb extra restaurant workers, uh, and they will uh, if there's some uh, fall in, uh, in wage rates, uh, in the uh, prices of what they have to pay. And uh, there are other areas where the consumers will absorb additional labor only if there's a more precipitous fall in price and thus in wages. So as between uh, uses which require a bigger drop in price uh, to find additional quantities demanded and uses which require a smaller drop in price uh, to find additional quantities demanded, uh, which do you think the consumers consider more important? If we have, uh, let's say, two different goods, uh, in one case, uh, consumers will buy more of this good at some reduction in prices, but the lower prices uh, still permit uh, the employers uh, to pay the ex-garment workers $400. In other cases, uh, the consumers will buy additional goods requiring services, comparable services of ex-garment workers, but only uh, at, uh, at prices that permit wages of $300 which do you think uh, implies a higher valuation on the part of the <coughs> consumers? The higher, uh, which, is the, which represents the higher valuation of the consumers? Uh, a use which they're willing to allow $400 for or a use they're willing to allow $300 for? Which do you value more? Something you're willing to pay up to $400 for or something you're willing to pay up to $300 for? <coughs> Obviously $400. So the, the garment workers, in fanning out into those uses that can absorb them at the least fall in, in wage rates compared to what they had been earning, uh, those will be the uses where the consumers are willing uh, to absorb the resulting additional quantities of products or services at the least fall in price. Now, uh, these represent uh, the most important of the previously sub-marginal uses for this type of labor. If we have a lesser demand for garment workers, uh, that makes their services available uh, for other uses that the same sort of labor can uh, provide. And uh, the uses into which that labor will be absorbed are those uh, that are the most important among the uses uh, that the labor was previously unavailable for because it was working producing garments. So factors of production in reduced demand, like the garment workers, uh, they are channeled into the uh, most important of their previously sub-marginal employments. They're uh, absorbed in the most important of their previously sub-marginal employments. Those are the employments that can absorb them with the least fall in their wage rates. Now, uh, how does this case differ uh, from having uh, a larger supply of such workers? Uh, suppose the demand for garment workers had not fallen, and we just ended up uh, having a larger supply of that same type of labor, equivalent to the uh, labor that was released by the fall in the demand for clothing. Where would the additional labor be absorbed? There are some uses for the additional labor where uh, you can only use it profitably if you're paying that labor 50 cents an hour. Uh, there are other uses, perhaps, uh, where you can absorb the labor profitably paying $5 an hour. Uh, which of the uses do you think those workers will be going into? The, the highest they can find, and the ones that will be the highest are the ones that uh, can uh, use the additional labor 
uh, with in the ways that the consumers most value. So when you have uh, factors of production in limited supply now available, uh, either in a larger overall supply or uh, are faced with a reduced demand, either way, the supply that is newly available, the, the new additional supply or the part of the supply that was previously used somewhere else and is now released, uh, the newly available supply will be absorbed in the most important of its previously sub-marginal uses. Now, this is why I say that uh, putting these two examples together, uh, the free market uh, responds uh, to events in a way that maximizes gains and minimizes losses. Uh, when we have uh, a supply of something made newly available, uh, either because there is an increase in the overall total supply or because part of the supply is no longer required for a previous use, that's the garment worker example, where does the supply newly available get used? In the uses that can absorb it with the least decline in the incomes of the sellers. That's the most important of the uses previously not uh, provided for. If we have a diminished supply or we have an additional demand for something that requires that part of the supply be taken away from uses previously provided for, where does the supply no longer available get drawn from? You already answered the question. When we have a reduced supply of something or an additional demand for that uh, same item and then part of the supply is no longer available for previous uses, like uh, the labor of optical goods workers and instrument makers because they're needed to expand the production of watches, where does the supply that is no longer available get drawn from? Where will its use be curtailed to match the lack of availability of supply? Yes? Least the least important of the previously covered uses. So uh, decreases in supply or increases in demand for a factor of production in limited supply, they are met uh, uh, by, uh, with the least possible loss. They're drawn from the least important of the employments previously covered by that supply. When we have uh, an enlarged supply, either because the overall supply is greater or because a part of the previous supply is released due to a diminution in demand somewhere, the supply newly available goes to the most important of the employments previously not provided for. So uh, additions to supply uh, go uh, to the most important of the previously sub-marginal employments. Uh, diminutions in supply uh, come from the least important of the previously marginal employment. They come from the previously marginal employments. This is how uh, the free market responds. So if, for example, we have to cope with uh, less oil, then the reduction in the supply will be drawn from those uses which are the least important of the uses of oil that we have previously provided for. And in the process, uh, what will be involved in determining what these uses are, uh, everybody in the system, whether in business or as a consumer, will be contemplating what alternatives do they have to the use of these oil products. They see the higher price of oil, and that makes them sit up and take notice, and they have to decide, uh, how much do I want to continue using so much of this? What alternatives do I have, if any? And to the extent that people have alternatives, like in the face of a higher price of gasoline, uh, there'll be some people whose alternative might be uh, they could carpool. Or there'll be other people, uh, if they uh, live in, the, uh, in an area uh, with other kinds of transportation, uh, they might decide uh, to take a bus or, uh, or a subway or whatever. Uh, business firms uh, might decide if they have uh, different factories in different parts of the country and their heating bills uh, are sharply increasing, 
uh, they might decide they'll concentrate their production in uh, areas that aren't as cold uh, to hold down the cost. Or they change their shipping methods. Or in some cases, they have to cease operations. But uh, overall, uh, the outcome, if, for example, there's a million barrels of oil per day less that would be available, if that's the grand total, then somewhere there has to be a million barrels of oil a day no longer consumed. And that will mean uh, there's somewhat less production of gasoline, somewhat less production of heating oil, jet fuel, propane, butane, etc., etc. And what's going to determine uh, to what extent there's less in each of these different possible uses? It'll be where the demand uh, for the resulting products is cut back, where the, and where there are no uh, readily available substitutes. Uh, the outcome will be determined literally by uh, the uh, thinking and, uh, and consideration and planning of all the users of oil and oil products in the economic system. Uh, the total of a million barrels of oil a day less uh, will end up being the outcome of what in many, many cases is uh, the uh, saving of a pint or quart here and there on the part of uh, vast numbers of individuals. Now, uh, finally, I turn to uh, point 13, uh, more on the harmonious integration of all production and consumption in a free market. Uh, we've actually, I think, if I'm not mistaken, already dealt with the significance of using lower priced factors in place of uh, higher priced factors. Uh, if not, uh, perhaps, does anyone recall that discussion? Do we have it? Uh, what's this? Suppose you can find that uh, they're now able to substitute uh, aluminum for silver, let's say, in some uh, industrial use. And silver is $6 an ounce, and aluminum is what? Uh, does anyone know the price of aluminum? a dollar a pound or something like that, but radically cheaper than silver. All right, if that is their relative prices, uh, $6 an ounce and $1 a pound, uh, what does that signify about the marginal utility of an ounce of silver uh, versus a pound of aluminum? It's substantially higher, right? Well, now, to the extent that we could substitute aluminum for silver, even if it took a pound of aluminum to substitute for an ounce of silver, if it's an ounce for ounce, that's even less. Uh, if we can substitute a pound of aluminum for an ounce of silver, uh, what is the silver made available for? And what is the aluminum no longer available for? Okay, now, uh, when, when the silver is made available, uh, what will happen to the price of silver? If initially it was six dollars, but yeah, part of, uh, silver will drop and aluminum will go up somewhat. Uh, there's a greater demand for aluminum, a lesser demand for silver, but uh, still it's extremely unlikely that uh, uh, their valuations would cross uh, the silver now maybe uh, five seventy-five an ounce, and the aluminum perhaps a dollar twenty a pound or something like that. So what is signified if uh, we withdraw something that has a marginal utility of no more than $1.20 and we make available something with a marginal utility of $5.75? What is signified about uh, the extent of the value gained versus the value lost from the perspective of the ultimate consumers? Does it signify being better off if you can have more of something that people value as highly as five seventy-five an ounce and a little bit less of something that they value at a dollar twenty a pound? Don't you think that that would signify an improvement? It would be increasing the supply of something more valuable at the expense of decreasing the supply of something less valuable. That should represent a net gain, and that, and that is. Uh, the outcome, uh, any time you can substitute uh, a lower priced factor of production for a higher priced factor of production and achieve the same results. Another example of the same uh, situation would be 
uh, uh, substituting for the labor of a physician, uh, the labor of an x-ray technician in reading or in taking uh, the x-rays. At one time, I think, uh, physicians had to take their own x-rays. Now, if you can uh, substitute an x-ray technician to take the x-rays uh, instead of the physician doing it, what's gained and what's lost? And more time for the physician to do things like perform diagnoses. We're increasing. Pardon me. More money for the technician for performing a higher end task. Okay, there's an improvement for the technician. Now, if this change had not occurred, uh, where would the technician be? He'd be doing something else. Uh, maybe he'd be a clerk somewhere. Who knows? Uh, the way things stand, we uh, gain uh, the additional diagnostic services of a physician, which are very highly valued, and we lose uh, the services of a clerk. Uh, which, uh, and it, the services that we lose might even have been much less valuable if at the same time there are developments going on that make it possible to get by with fewer clerks. So uh, we're gaining, th there's a net gain in the uh, valuable services of physicians, a much greater gain uh, than loss of alternative uh, services or products. And that's the outcome any time uh, you are able to use uh, an equally good, less expensive factor of production in place of a more expensive factor. Now this is something that's uh, not generally seen. I mean, obviously businessmen are concerned uh, to the best of their ability uh, anytime they can find an equally good, less expensive way of doing something, they'll do it. Uh, but I don't think very many of them are aware of the wider social implications of their behavior, and still fewer people in the general society are. Uh, they don't see uh, a concern uh, with holding down costs as a means of uh, contributing to the expansion in production in the economic system. Now, a uh, further development along these same lines, uh, I mentioned the significance of cost calculations. Now, very, very often, uh, perhaps uh, more often than not, uh, there's more than one way uh, to produce a given good, uh, more than one way uh, to accomplish a given result. Uh, for example, uh, suppose your objective is to get across a body of water. Well, one possible way is to build a bridge across the body of water. Or you could tunnel under the water. Or you could have uh, a ferry boat line. Or uh, you could detour around the body of water. Uh, these are different uh, possible ways. And you could uh, locate the bridge or the tunnel at different points. And those are more possibilities. Uh, you might have different designs. You can have uh, different types of bridges and so forth. Uh, similarly, when you generate electric power, uh, you could do it, uh, in some instances, uh, through falling water, or you could use solar power. Uh, you could have uh, coal-fired plants, oil-fired plants, uh, gas-fired plants, atomic plants. Uh, they're all different uh, possibilities, and each of these has uh, probably uh, several different variations of design. Now, other things being equal, uh, which will uh, the business firms uh, in question want to choose? Which methods will they want? Yes? Is there any uncertainty as to which they would prefer other things being equal? The lowest cost method. They prefer the lowest cost method. Now, uh, the fact that a method is lower cost has a major, uh, wider economic social significance. It means uh, the lower cost method is the method that has the least adverse impact economically on the rest of the system. It withdraws uh, the least valued uh, combination of factors of production at the margin. It makes possible this given result in a way that interferes least with the ability to produce in the rest of the economy. As indicated, uh, by uh, the sum of the prices of the factors of production. The reason one method has a lower cost than another method is the result of the fact either that it's able to use smaller quantities of the factors of production or less valuable factors of production. Either way, to the extent that it succeeds at its lower cost uh, by being able to use smaller quantities, what uh, is obviously the effect on the ability to produce in the rest of the economy. It's greater. Uh, factors of production are left over 
uh, to produce in other lines. To the extent that uh, the lower cost is based on using less valued factors of production, well, that means it's making uh, the more valued factors of production available for other things. It's accomplishing this result by the withdrawal of relatively low-valued factors of production and leaving the more highly valued factors of production available for other things. Now, this is something uh, very few people have realized, I think, but uh, the cost uh, of uh, accomplishing anything uh, uh, is a, an indication of its overall economic impact. The cost of achieving any given result is the indicator of its overall economic impact. And uh, following the lowest cost methods, which is what businessmen are automatically doing based on the profit motive, that means uh, the production of each particular item is geared in such a way that it permits the greatest production in the rest of the economy. It has the least adverse economic impact on the rest of the economy. And I think uh, this is something uh, almost totally ignored. Uh, there's very little discussion of economic impacts, uh, much less realization uh, that uh, costs are the indicator of economic impact. Uh, instead, we have concentration on such things as environmental impact uh, that no one could uh, truly describe to begin with. And uh, there are demands that uh, uh, th 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 be the minimal environmental impact irrespective of the cost which means irrespective of the economic impact. Now I have a uh, last statement here, what the prices of consumers' goods reflect. Well, uh, they reflect uh, 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 the uh, state, the degree of scarcity of the item itself, uh, together uh, with the valuations of all of the buyers uh, and potential buyers. But also, uh, where you have consumers' goods that come from factors of production in scarce supply, uh, like gasoline coming from oil, uh, the price of gasoline is indirectly an indicator of the overall supply of crude oil and uh, the demand not only for gasoline, but for all the other oil products. Uh, the demand for all the oil products factors into the demand for oil and thus into the price of oil which comes back via cost into the price of gasoline. And so the price of something like gasoline, whether one is aware of it or not, is an indicator indirectly of the overall supply of crude oil and of the demand for all of the different oil products. Okay, let me pause here and ask uh, if we have any, any questions. I know some of this uh, may be a little difficult. I don't think it's all that difficult. Well, I hope uh, you all have with you uh, Supplement 5. Uh, I didn't realize I was going to get this far tonight, so uh, I perhaps should have, had I known it, I would have sent you all an email and told you to bring Supplement 5. By all means, bring it next week. All right, what we've done up to this point, I think, uh, is... Uh, hopefully gained some understanding of the uh, fundamental principles of uh, price formation in a free market. Uh, starting with the demand and supply in terms of schedules and curves, and then on to uh, the uniformity of profit principle, uh, the, inf the power it gives to consumers, uh, its uh, dynamic element of uh, bringing about continuous improvements in production, and the uh, geographic uniformity of prices, uh, the uh, temporal uniformity of pr uh, principle, uh, the principles pertaining to wage rates, uh, the relationship between prices and costs, and now uh, tonight, uh, these further principles on uh, demand and supply. And uh, in the light of all this, we're now in a position uh, to uh, consider uh, interferences in the free market in the form of price controls and their uh, offspring shortages. And uh, these discussions, I think, will uh, help to confirm and reinforce uh, the, the value of the free market. And uh, while uh, price controls uh, do not have tremendous immediate topical relevance, uh, there are some instances of price controls, 
uh, notably rent controls. Uh, it's uh, not at all unlikely that uh, within not too many years uh, there'll be uh, further examples of price controls or at least widespread demands for their imposition and we'll be lucky uh, to avoid their imposition. And uh, that's to be expected if you have a uh, society with very, very little understanding of uh, how the price system operates or what it accomplishes. I think uh, the way most people uh, see uh, prices is they think uh, prices are arbitrarily set by the, the sellers uh, at the expense of the average consumer, uh, especially when we have uh, prices rising. Uh, people tend to blame uh, businessmen for the rise in prices. They think the rise is arbitrary without any foundation or justification. And uh, they then look to the government as the uh, agent uh, to, uh, uh, to put the businessmen down. I don't think, in fact, the way I think people look at matters is uh, not very different than the way our ancestors centuries ago uh, looked at the physical world. You know, it hasn't always been the case that people regarded the physical world as lawful, as uh, functioning according to natural laws of, of physics and mathematics. Uh, try to uh, think of the mentality for a moment of people in the dark ages and Oh, the screen went off. Thank you. Uh, try to think for a moment of the mentality of people in the dark ages. And uh, perhaps uh, they'd have a flood and someone's little hut would be washed away or uh, his oxen or whatever uh, it, it, uh, contracted some disease and perished. Uh, what uh, kind of reaction might we expect uh, such people to have? What kind of explanation would they have of these uh, terrible phenomena, and what sort of remedy would they seek to deal with them? Do you think their explanation would be, oh, we had floods because uh, there was tremendous snowfall in the mountains over the winter, and we had uh, an early spring with high temperatures, so we had a lot of melted snow that uh, produced the floods, uh, perfectly understandable. And uh, we have the uh, disease uh, because there are certain germs uh, which are carried by certain uh, 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 bugs or whatever uh, that bite the animals. They die, maybe people die. Uh, do you think the explanation would run along uh, those lines? I don't think so. So what sort of explanation do you think they'd have? something along religious lines in a way, broadly considered. Uh, how would they view their, uh, their ills? What, from where did they come? Are well, there evil forces working in the world uh, out to harm them? And uh, what would be their source of protection? Okay, it could be the church or uh, some... Uh, uh, some sort of a mystical remedy. Uh, they'd want bigger, tougher, more powerful spirits to intervene on their side against the evil forces that were harming them. Uh, is this uh, unfamiliar? Does it, does it ring any kind of bell? Or yeah, what happened with the uh, Salem witch trial? Okay, it would be the same sort of mentality, the same kind of mentality. Uh, people would think that their ills, uh, their physical ills, coming from uh, the, the physical world, that they were the uh, result of uh, evil spirits. And uh, their protection and the remedy lay in gaining the support of bigger, tougher, more powerful spirits. Uh, it, it's the old uh, uh, classic uh, war between uh, the devil and God, God and the devil. Well, uh, how, do, uh, how does that mentality differ uh, from the way so many people view uh, big business and government? They think, here's big business, uh, they're the evil forces uh, conspiring at any moment uh, to depress the people's wages, raise the prices they pay, uh, poison their foods, uh, give them unsafe buildings, uh, dangerous drugs, and what's their remedy? The government, that's the bigger, tougher, good spirit. And that's, so I think people are viewing uh, the economic world in a way uh, very similar uh, to the way our ancestors viewed the physical world. 
and the reason they can view that view it that way is they have no knowledge of economic law. They have no knowledge of the fact that uh, such things as price determination, the whole functioning of the economic system, is lawful in the same way that the physical world is lawful. Uh, the, the general uh, cultural understanding has not reached the point of realizing that uh, the concept of natural law applies to relations among human beings and in the economic realm as well as in the physical realm. In fact, there may be some indications they're losing it again in the physical realm. Okay, so uh, it's in the, the light of that background that when uh, things start to go bad, if prices start rising, uh, people are prepared to blame business and they uh, demand as the solution uh, the government to intervene. Or if anything bad is happening, uh, the solution, according to most of our contemporaries, is to have the government intervene. All right, well, let's turn now uh, to price controls and shortages and start uh, with the distinction between shortages and scarcities. Uh, often, uh, these two are treated as though uh, they were the same phenomenon. Uh, they're actually very, very distinct. Uh, scarcity refers uh, to limitation of supply. Scarcity refers to limitation of supply. Uh, you can have things which are extremely limited in supply, like gold and diamonds, and uh, there need be no shortage of them. There will be no shortage if you have a free market. What will stop the shortage? A shortage being a situation in which people are attempting to buy more of something than uh, is available for sale or exists. More supply. Pardon me? More supply. What, what, um, su more supply as what? In relation to demand. What limits, what limits, what prevents a shortage despite a scarcity is the, the freedom of the price to rise. See, here we are, uh, the world's annual production of gold, I think, is uh, possibly 60 million ounces, not much more than that, conceivably 80 million ounces. Now that uh, doesn't add up to very much. Uh, if you compare, compare it to the uh, annual production of iron or copper or whatever. Uh, there's so very little of it, but uh, anyone who's prepared to pay the prevailing market price of gold can obtain all the gold that he wants. See, what is it that limits the quantity of gold demanded uh, to the very limited annual production that takes place? The height of the price, over $400 an ounce. So at $400 an ounce, uh, that rules out all kinds of possible uses for gold, all, all sorts of uses that are technologically possible, but uh, they're just too expensive. And similarly with diamonds. There's no shortage of these things, uh, even though they're incredibly scarce. Now, a, a shortage is a situation in which uh, buyers are attempting to buy more uh, than sellers are prepared to sell, uh, typically more than sellers have available to sell. Now, the only thing that keeps a shortage in existence is that the price is prohibited from rising sufficiently to reduce the quantity demanded to the supply available. The only thing that explains a shortage is uh, a price control. And you could have price controls creating shortages even of the things that we think of as the most abundant. Uh, we could have a record high grain harvest. And uh, we could still create a shortage of it through price controls. How? Well, suppose we had a price control uh, that put the price of grain at a point where it uh, now appeared profitable uh, uh, to use it uh, to start feeding uh, animals in feedlots on a large scale. Well, how much can they eat? They can eat huge quantities uh, such that uh, record high grain crops would not be sufficient. And then we'd have a shortage of grain in the midst of record abundance. As a matter of fact, when we had the oil shortage in the United States, the situation was not uh, fundamentally different. And uh, if we had an oil shortage now, uh, the situation would not be fundamentally different. If you consider 
uh, the per capita consumption of oil in the United States compared to the per capita consumption of oil in most parts of the world at the present time, uh, how does it stand? It's very, very high, right? And if you consider uh, the per capita consumption of the United States today uh, compared to past years, I'm sure it's very, very high. Now suppose our supply were uh, five or 10 percent less, which it could easily become uh, given some of the uh, developments going on in the world, and we had a price control. Uh, so prices would be frozen about where they are right now, but uh, we have five or 10 percent less uh, supply available. Well, with the same set of prices, uh, how much oil would people uh, be attempting to obtain? Same, same, the, uh, same as they're now doing, but they'd be five or 10 percent less. So what situation would exist? A shortage, and we'd have that shortage even though from the point of view of most of the rest of the world and the point of view of most of modern economic history, our supplies of oil per capita are at extremely high levels and still would be even if they were 5 or 10 percent less. So we'd have a shortage in the face of a very great physical abundance. Well, what would explain the shortage? Price the price control, the price control. If we didn't have the price control, uh, even though the supply diminished, a diminution in supply would not cause a shortage. What would it cause, which would stop the shortage? Which would stop, that would cause a rise in price. At the rise in price, the quantity demanded would be reduced to the same extent as the supply available, so no shortage would result. Now, let me uh, try to explain this next point. Uh, scarcities do not cause shortages. Well, I've actually explained that. Uh, scarcities by themselves uh, cause higher prices. Uh, in the face of the higher prices, the quantity demanded is reduced uh, to whatever extent needed uh, to make it commensurate with the reduced supply. Uh, but then I add, shortages cause scarcities. Well, shortages uh, make scarcities worse uh, by their disruptive effects on production. Uh, with shortages, uh, the fact that the price is not allowed to rise, uh, that allows the item to go on being used for uh, previously marginal purposes, and at the same time, the supply may now be unavailable for the most vital and urgent purposes. So you just think that we have 5% uh, less supply and the least important of the uses are still being provided for, uh, somewhere there, has, there has to be a reduction in usage. Only because the price is prohibited from rising, the reduction in, us in usage will not be at the expense of the previously marginal employments. It might well be at the expense of the utmost vitally important employments. And exactly that is what happened uh, in the uh, oil shortage that we had uh, back in the 70s. Now, I know uh, some people complain, why do I talk about uh, the oil shortage in the 70s? Because happily, there was no oil shortage in the 80s or 90s. Uh, uh, there are some things which, uh, the uh, negative developments, uh, thankfully, uh, are not yet occurring on a continuing basis. So uh, thankfully, our last uh, experience of this kind was in uh, the 1970s. Now, uh, in the uh, first oil shortage, the, most, the major one, the more protracted one, which occurred in 73, 74, uh, there were actually uh, news stories about uh, oil rigs uh, off the coast of Louisiana uh, being threatened with having to shut down because they lacked uh, certain oil products necessary to their continued operation. I suppose they were, they were lubricants of some kind. Now just think about this for a moment. Here you are, you have a functioning oil well. Uh, it's turning out, uh, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of barrels of oil per day, and it needs uh, a few drops of oil uh, to keep its uh, parts uh, working smoothly. And they can't get it because there's a shortage. Well, where is the, the oil that they would need? It, someone else has it. Now, what, just think about the fact, uh, is there any use for oil products uh, 
that would be in a position to outbid an oil well for the use of oil? Probably not. Very, very I doubt that anything could. If, if uh, for a few drops you're producing hundreds of gallons, uh, you can uh, pay any price practically, much higher uh, than virtually anybody else. So in a free market, there could never have remotely been a question of oil rigs uh, being threatened with shutdown for lack of any sort of oil supplies. But when you have a price control, the most marginal use of oil can still go on affording it. And if it continues to be supplied, uh, someone else somewhere uh, has to do without, and that party can end up being uh, oil fields, oil rigs. Now. Uh, the uh, oil rigs didn't have to shut down, but the only thing that uh, permitted them not to was uh, there was some uh, special executive order, uh, perhaps by the governor of Louisiana, I forget just whom, uh, mandating uh, the shipment of the necessary oil supplies to them. But, but it took this uh, special directive uh, to keep them going. Uh, another example along the same lines, a little less extreme, uh, there were uh, truckers uh, delivering food supplies uh, to southern Florida uh, who refused to, uh, to go ahead and deliver them because they were afraid in the face of the uh, shortage of diesel fuel and gasoline that uh, on their way back up the Florida Peninsula, uh, they wouldn't be able to find fuel. Now just think, uh, here we are, uh, people delivering food supplies. Now, if you had a free market price of fuel, uh, let's say the, the price is going to be stiff, but what's required to uh, compensate the truckers for their higher fuel costs when we get to, down to uh, cans of peas and so forth? A, a somewhat higher price, maybe a penny a can for this and that. Uh, do you think that uh, the delivery of food supplies uh, would have been an item sacrificed uh, because of the diminution in the supply of oil that we had? If we had a free market and the truckers uh, were able to outbid uh, the marginal users of oil. No. So, uh, a major consequence of price controls uh, in uh, uh, depriving the market of its means of adjusting quantity demanded to the supply available is that it literally makes it possible uh, for the uh, uh, most marginal employments of a uh, product or factor of production to go on continuing to be served at the expense of the most vital and urgent employments. And to the extent that that happens, what do you think happens uh, to production? If we had had uh, the oil rigs actually shutting down uh, for lack of oil products to keep them going, what would that have done to the production of oil? It would have decreased, made the scarcity worse, much worse. But, but it's in the nature of price controls and shortages uh, by causing uh, such economic chaos uh, to reduce the ability of the system to produce, uh, diminish supplies, uh, make scarcities greater. So this is why I say uh, price controls cause shortages. Uh, not, not only cause shortages, uh, price controls cause scarcities. They make scarcities worse. They interfere with production by misallocating supplies of factors of production. Yes, Mr. Say. I have a hard time directly following something that happened last year um, with the lithium ion, which is used in the, um, the batteries. Yeah. Uh, the laptop and the cell phones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I uh, understand that uh, at some point a year ago, uh, one of the Africa, Africa producers decided to shut down the production. And uh, a lot of the Japanese suppliers of these battery cells um, started to raise the prices on the, on the computer makers and the cell phone manufacturers, et cetera, et cetera. So, on the surface, Sure, you know, we're looking at this as a case where the producers, in this case the, the, the suppliers, are jacking up prices by, by uh, you know, manipulating their production. And, and so the best of my knowledge, there's no uh, um, price control on the lithium ion. Yeah. So as a result, there was a lot of shortage uh, for the battery products. 
that means they can be sure they can find an application. And uh, based on what I see, it's not due to a price control. So literally, it was, it was a quote evil practice by the producer. Okay, now you said a, a shortage. I want to be clear on two things. You started by saying an African supplier uh, of some basic material uh, went out of business, uh, stopped um, supplying. I don't, I don't know the background of whether it was, you know, it went out of business or it was uh, just a business decision. Okay, all right. So there was a reduction in something reduction. required to produce these uh, ion batteries, lithium ion batteries. Okay. So there's no price control. There. I mean, there's no price control, but there's a reduction in the supply for whatever reason. And therefore, it costs short. Okay. Now, what happened to the price of these batteries, and why? Now, when you say shortage, do you mean that there was a situation where there are people uh, out seeking to buy these batteries, willing to pay the market price, but they couldn't obtain the batteries? Um, correct. Well, what would have happened had they offered more money? Well, you have a lot of uh, applications out there that require them. So if there's limited supply, because some, the boundary is that to shut down, you reach a point where there's just simply not enough, yeah. at least in the short term. Okay. Now, there was no uh, market of any kind where you could obtain these batteries at a higher price? Um, See, well, you see, what I could visualize is uh, perhaps uh, the uh, manufacturers of the batteries, maybe they had contractual commitments. Did they, was this the case, that there were contractual commitments to uh, sell the computer manufacturers, laptop manufacturers, etc., cetera, uh, batteries at a contractually, uh, contractually set price, and then they just couldn't uh, deliver? That see, that, that could happen. See, I am... You know, I can only speak from the the the, the electronic product. Okay. Position. All right. So you're in a, a company producing some electronic product that needs these batteries, okay. right? Now, uh, did your company have some agreement with a supplier uh, to receive batteries at a contractually given price? Not a set price. Not at any set price. No. And. Was anyone getting any batteries anywhere? Uh, eventually. Well, it wasn't the case that there was zero batteries in the market, right? Correct. Okay. So now, in these cases, I would still say that uh, whoever would offer a higher price would get batteries. It might have to be a steeply higher price. Uh, you, it might have to be uh, someone is getting his batteries, but at a sufficiently high price, he'll give them to you. There had to be something uh, preventing a rise in price. No, no, that would also mean that someone else, someone elsewhere, won't be getting their batteries. Right? Well, yes, but if it's someone who's, let's say, entitled to get certain batteries contractually, you could buy his right, give him a price that will make him be glad to let you have the batteries. But there still is a shortage. No, there would not be a shortage then, because here we are. Let's say uh, we have uh, two, uh, two companies. Uh, uh, you're counting on some batteries. Uh, another company is counting on the batteries. The company have them. We're happy taking your money. You wouldn't have a quantity demanded greater than supply available if the price could rise. Now, maybe there was something preventing the price from rising. Uh, I don't know what that could be. Because in these situations, uh, I would assume there would be some market where there'd be people uh, who were getting certain shipments and at a high enough price, uh, they'd be willing to let others have them. So uh, you, you could have a situation where if it's uh, considered temporary, uh, see the uh, makers of the batteries uh, want to maintain a, a long-term market and if they think they're in a position uh, to get back to uh, the normal battery prices and with an adequate supply, uh, they might be reluctant to raise their prices. Uh, they might say to their customers, uh, wait a while, we can't supply you now. But if the customers truly wanted it, uh, uh, they could get batteries, but they'd have to pay a higher price. Uh, 
perhaps there is some sort of a price pricing issue between the, the cell manufacturer and the foundry. And and the, and the what? The foundries or, or the, the producers of the source of these chemicals or, or whatever you call them. So at that level, there could be some sort of a well, I would think it's it, it would be more uh, at, as I understand it so far uh, between the manufacturers of the batteries and the uh, product, uh, the end users, uh, the uh, laptop makers, uh, the iPod makers, or whatever. No, my question is whether there is some sort of a pricing agreement because between, let's say, the iPod maker and the battery manufacturer, there is a pricing. There's no pricing agreement. Uh, 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 there's no price uh, price control thing. So okay. There could be at the other the other. Okay. Well, you see, thing. if there is no price control of any kind, uh, then I I would have great difficulty understanding why the price didn't ju just go up. It did. Well, if it did, then uh, there there wouldn't be a shortage unless the price didn't go up very much or not enough. A shortage, I would say a shortage is a situation in which uh, at the prevailing price, uh, buyers are seeking to buy more than, than is available. And buyers will seek to buy less if the price goes up. Now, maybe they won't seek to buy less if the price goes up just a little bit in certain circumstances, but certainly the price is capable of rising sufficiently so that whatever the supply in the market may be, that's all the buyers will seek. So anyone able and willing to pay that price, however high it may be, uh, will be able to get the supply. You'll be able to get whatever the supply may be. Now, uh, see, just ask yourself this. Think in terms of an auction. I think this gets to the essence of it. Here we are, we have an auction, and there's one item up for auction, and initially there's 100 bidders. Uh, will there continue to be more bidders than there are units? as the auction progresses. There'll be fewer and fewer bidders until what? Even now here we have a case, there's only one unit. There's only one unit. We started with 100 bidders. How many bidders will we end with? One, because the price will be high enough so that it's too high for all bidders but one. Now, if we have two units, the price will be high enough so it's too high for all bidders but two. If we have two million units, it'll be high enough, so it's too high for all bidders but for these two million. Now, if we have a situation where normally there's 100 million units, and then for some reason uh, there's 50 million units, well, initially the price was such that 100 million units could be afforded. Now the price should rise so high that only 50 million units can be afforded. unless there's some kind of restraint preventing the price from rising. And incidentally, if the price did not rise, uh, you couldn't uh, look to any kind of uh, manipulation motive. Uh, you see, uh, what you might find occasionally is uh, if there's a very rare material and uh, its price will go up if its supply is reduced, uh, it could, at some in some circumstances, pay the uh, producers uh, to reduce the supply, but only if they can succeed in driving the price up. <coughs> See, you might have a, a cartel arrangement sometimes. Uh, you might have uh, one firm controlling the whole supply. Uh, like the beers, uh, for many years, that's a cartel of diamond producers. Uh, they maintain a high price of diamonds by restricting the supply of diamonds. They, they uh, deliberately uh, hold back uh, diamonds to make them scarcer in the market. Does that create a shortage of diamonds? Why not? Because the price is going up. Because, because the price goes up to the point of reducing the quantity demanded to the limited supply available. Now, if something analogous uh, were to happen in the making of lithium ion batteries, uh, then the only possible explanation of anyone doing this would be uh, that he hoped to get a higher price 
And, but at that higher price, there would be no shortage. The item would be scarcer, more expensive, but uh, it wouldn't be in a state of shortage. A shortage exists when uh, the supply is reduced and the price is not allowed to rise. That's what would create the shortage. I now, uh, I want to try as fast as possible uh, to explain the various ways that price controls create shortages. Uh, once they do create shortages, uh, then as I've indicated in these examples of the uh, Louisiana oil rigs and the uh, uh, trucking, the, tr the food shipments to southern Florida, uh, once you have a state of shortages, uh, then uh, production can decline uh, further just because of the economic chaos entailed in shortages. Something we'll investigate in considerable detail uh, probably next week, it has to be next week. But uh, first I want to go into how it is that uh, price controls create shortages. Uh, they do so uh, by artificially enlarging the quantity of a good demanded. I think we've seen that. If you uh, hold the price down, uh, you're allowing the quantity demanded uh, to be maintained, uh, not to be restricted to the supply available. But uh, now uh, let's briefly consider the various ways that price controls also reduce supply, apart from their further uh, devastating way via having created shortages. Well, one very obvious way is uh, insofar as they make the production of a good unprofitable. Uh, and this uh, occurs uh, particularly uh, if you have uh, a period of inflation. Uh, take uh, rent control and the price controls we had <coughs> back uh, in years past on, uh, uh, on oil. Uh, you could also have the same thing on electric power uh, or anything where there's a controlled price. Uh, if we have inflation, what will inflation be doing uh, to the costs of production of these items under price control? Increase it increases it. And then uh, what does that do to the ability of such firms uh, to save and reinvest uh, to meet growth in demand? They can't do it. So uh, you have growing demand and uh, the inability of supply to keep pace because the uh, profits and reinvestment are restricted. I think this goes a long way uh, toward explaining the phenomenon of brownouts and blackouts uh, with in, in electricity. Uh, the uh, profits of electric utilities, uh, they've been under price control. Uh, they're a regulated legal monopoly, uh, so it's understandable why there's price control. But uh, you could have a controlled price that uh, wouldn't curtail their production, provided uh, the controlled price were high enough uh, to give them a competitive rate of profit. If you have a controlled price that yields a competitive rate of profit, uh, there will not be a shortage, at least not as a permanent situation, because it makes it possible to enlarge the supply to keep pace with the demand. But if you have a controlled price that uh, prevents that, and the demand is growing, and inflation is uh, uh, further raising costs, well, uh, then you'll have uh, the demand outstripping uh, the supply. And plus, uh, here in California, uh, in particular, uh, the situation has been worsened uh, by the fact that uh, even to the extent that the power companies have wanted to build power plants again and again, they've been prevented uh, by environmentalism. So uh, making the production of a good uh, unprofitable or insufficiently profitable to keep pace with demand, uh, that will result in shortages. But uh, you can also have something unprofitable uh, to the point where the industry uh, will disappear. Uh, and there, uh, rent control in New York City, I think, is a leading example. Rent control was imposed in New York City in 1943. And the uh, controlled housing was subsequently allowed a few 15% rent increases. Meanwhile, what did inflation do uh, to the costs of constructing and operating housing? It increased it radically. And so uh, in case after case, uh, the rent-controlled housing uh, became more and more unprofitable, not even covering uh, the operating costs. And when that occurs, what happens? Pardon me? Well, the, the housing becomes abandoned. And there were 
tens of thousands of apartments in New York City, uh, particularly in the South Bronx, uh, that were abandoned, uh, where uh, many fires were set uh, uh, to get the proceeds of insurance, I assume. Uh, uh, I remember taking a, uh, an elevated train ride in the South Bronx uh, some years ago, and it reminded me of newsreel shots of uh, Dresden, Germany after the Allied bombings. It was really a period, uh, 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 a scene of devastation. And uh, you'd have to expect that uh, if inflation continues jacking up the costs and the uh, rates are frozen, uh, well then more and more of the supply becomes unprofitable to maintain and it disappears. And to a large degree in some places, uh, rental housing has almost disappeared. Uh, uh, its place has been taken by co-ops and condominiums. I think the uh, growth of co-ops and condominiums is very much uh, a response to rent control or the threat of rent control. The idea of separate people owning pieces of one building doesn't make all that much sense. The logical procedure is a landlord owns the building and he rents the units. But if you have rent control, uh, that uh, threatens the profitability of rental housing and uh, so it encourages uh, these other types. Uh, making a local market uncompetitive. Uh, if you have uh, price controls uh, in some local markets, but not in all, uh, and I think that was the case uh, when we had price controls on oil, uh, there were no price controls, I believe, uh, in most of Western Europe and in Japan, uh, which meant that uh, when uh, oil got scarcer and more expensive, it could, its price could rise in those areas, but not here in the United States. So which, areas, uh, w which area was deprived of supplies? In the United States, we were made uncompetitive. The price control prevented us uh, from uh, matching the bids uh, for oil uh, with uh, Japan and Western Europe. Uh, now I refer to uh, application to the, uh, to the surge in the price of wheat and soybeans. Uh, I mentioned that we've had tremendous agricultural surpluses because of the farm subsidy program, but in 1972 and 1973, uh, most of these surpluses, at least for the time being, were suddenly swept out of the country. And there was actually serious concern uh, whether there'd be enough grain uh, remaining in the United States to meet domestic consumption. And the way this happened was uh, we had price controls on uh, just about everything at this time. And at the same time, uh, there was a substantial devaluation of the dollar in terms of the major foreign currencies. So if we have a frozen price of grain and soybeans and so forth here in the United States, but suddenly the dollar costs substantially less, uh, substantially fewer uh, marks, yen, uh, pounds, etc., what is the effect of that on the price of these goods uh, in terms of marks, yen, and pounds? It suddenly drops, and then what happens to the quantities demanded? It goes up, and uh, there's nothing to stop the increase, now, just think, uh, would exports, would exports uh, normally ever be a threat uh, to uh, an adequate local supply in the United States? Would we normally ever have to worry about exporting something to the extent that we would not have enough for domestic consumption? What would guarantee adequate supplies for the domestic market? Pardon me? A free market, if we have a greater need for supplies here, the price rises. As the price rises, that diminishes the quantity of foreign, of, of goods demanded from abroad, and it protects the supply here. But if the price is prohibited from rising, then is there anything that can operate to protect the domestic supply? No, then it is threatened. And then uh, uh, the next step to protecting it was uh, to impose export embargoes. It's uh, usually not uh, recalled, but in the very same year that uh, OPEC uh, had this oil embargo against us, we imposed a soybean embargo against Japan. Uh, 
uh, not because uh, we were deliberately out to wreck the Japanese economy, but because as the result of our price controls plus currency devaluation, uh, there was a huge export of soybeans to Japan, and uh, prohibiting the price of soybeans from rising, uh, the only way to protect domestic supplies was to prohibit their further exportation. And then the aftermath of that was uh, that the Japanese uh, encouraged a great production of soybeans in Brazil. So uh, our uh, exportability was uh, diminished thereafter. Uh, we had freezing weather in the Northeast, uh, in uh, New York, New Jersey, New England. Uh, there was a natural gas crisis in 1977. Uh, schools had to close, factories had to close, because there, wasn't, because there was an acute shortage of natural gas. And hardly anyone uh, saw the connection between uh, price controls on interstate natural gas. At the time, uh, the, I think it was the Federal Power Commission was controlling the interstate price of natural gas at something like 42 cents per cubic foot. Meanwhile, in Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, where most of the natural gas is produced, uh, they had an unregulated intrastate market where natural gas was selling at over a dollar a cubic foot. Now, if you're a producer in a place like Texas, Louisiana, or Oklahoma, and you can get a dollar a cubic foot in, in your home state, but you can only get uh, 42 cents a cubic foot in New Jersey, uh, where are you going to want to sell your gas? in your home market. And so the only supplies that moved uh, were those that, uh, where there was a contractual obligation. Now, what would have served to move more supplies uh, from the producing states uh, to the states that had an urgent need for them? If the price had been allowed to rise, if you didn't have uh, this price control. So price control prevented uh, th these uh, northern markets uh, from uh, being competitive with the intrastate markets uh, in uh, Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma. Uh, there's a further point uh, we already dealt with, making the consumption of a commodity too rapid and thus reducing future supply. Uh, this is the example. A crop comes in one, month's, uh, uh, one month below normal. If the price is allowed to rise, the shortfall can be spread over the entire year. If the price is prohibited from rising, consumption proceeds at its old rate. And then uh, if we kept it up uh, through 11 months, we'd have nothing left. We'd have a famine with that commodity in the 12th month. If we take it off at any intervening point, then the price has to rise higher than it otherwise would have because the rate of restriction of consumption is that needs to be that much greater. Uh, price control can reduce supply uh, by making uh, uh, any given occupation or industry unable to compete for labor. Uh, imagine, for example, uh, that uh, the government were trying to control uh, some particular price. Uh, let's say it wanted to control, for some reason, uh, a private uh, parcel delivery. Uh, so it wanted to control the rates of UPS and FedEx, their ground operations. <coughs> Now, uh, uh, this would lead uh, fairly soon uh, to needing to control the wage rates of the uh, UPS and FedEx uh, drivers, because uh, unless you want uh, uh, UPS and FedEx to go broke, uh, having to pay uh, rising costs, uh, if you're controlling a price, uh, pretty soon you'll need to control the further prices that constitute the costs. Well, what happens when you get to the point of controlling uh, the wage rates of a given industry in order to keep its prices down? People would leave that industry to go to other industries. They'd leave that industry. Uh, the drivers uh, for these uh, delivery companies uh, can drive for other companies. And if wage rates elsewhere are going up, uh, then they'd be losing their labor, and uh, this would undercut the operations of this uh, price-controlled industry. Uh, very similarly, E, making some products of a factor of production unable to compete with its other products. Suppose, for example, uh, the government is concerned that uh, poor families can't afford enough milk for their children, and it decides to make milk more affordable uh, by imposing a price control. All right, well, uh, 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 this can simply deprive milk of its profitability and undercut its production, 
Uh, so suppose the government goes further and they not only control uh, the retail price of milk, they control the price at the wholesale level and they control the price at the farm level. Uh, even if they've done that much, uh, what happens if they've left uncontrolled uh, the price of cheese, ice cream, butter, and uh, other milk products? How will the supply of milk be used? Uh, more for the other products. So uh, they'd be uh, cutting the supply of milk that way. They'd be prohibiting milk from being competitive with other products of the same basic material. And uh, that is the story, I think, in large measure uh, with conversions of apartment buildings from rental units to co-ops and condominiums. Uh, a given apartment building has uh, these three different uses. It can be rental units, it can be co-ops, or it can be condominiums. Now, if you impose rent controls and you don't impose controls on the price of co-ops and condominiums, then which way will the available uh, supply of apartments be used? Uh, for these alternatives. Uh, this is something that, surprisingly, uh, the media doesn't seem to understand. I remember uh, back in the 80s at some point, Los Angeles imposed rent control. I, I think maybe they've taken it off by now, but they allowed rates of increase that uh, were higher than the rates that were actually occurring. Uh, so possibly they j just became a dead letter. But in any case, uh, practically the very next day, uh, the media reported that landlords were suddenly converting uh, their rental units uh, to co-ops and condominiums. And they thought, uh, this is a dreadful, evil act on their part. Well, is there any simple logical explanation? If you deprive one use of something of its profitability, and you know that landlords are acting like any businessman uh, to be profitable, uh, not unprofitable, then what outcome should you expect? Uh, who should bear the responsibility? The uh, landlords uh, for doing uh, what comes naturally to them as profit-seeking businessmen, or the uh, Los Angeles City Council for acting in uh, defiance of that? I think it's obviously the Los Angeles City Council, not the landlords, uh, for acting to be profitable. Okay, uh, I see, well, I'll just make my last observation how price controls are equivalent to a prohibition of production. Uh, in New York, for example, uh, the uh, city government for all of these years would always say they'd like nothing better than to have more housing. They'd love more rental housing. What more could they desire more ardent? Well, that's all fine and well and good. Uh, the only thing is that by their behavior, they demonstrate that they don't want the housing to be profitable. Well, if you tell people, uh, you're, go ahead, please do it, you're welcome to, but we will prevent you from profiting from doing it, well, will anyone do it voluntarily? How does that differ in substance from making the activity illegal? It really doesn't. It's essentially the same thing. So uh, you often have, uh, I, I don't know if the concept of hypocrisy applies when it results from such profound, enormous, unfathomable ignorance. Okay, uh, see you all next week.